Yeah. Right. So, so this is going to be a, a high-level survey. Um, the story is, I gave a talk a few weeks ago in Israel at a workshop to a broad theory audience. Turned out to be mostly cryptographers. Uh, so, you know, awareness with theory CS, but not necessarily much about algorithmic game theory. So, uh, afterwards, I thought maybe that'd be a, a good talk for this audience uh, as well. So, but I jump in with questions if you want to drill down on any of the details that I'm glossing over uh, and so on. Okay. So maybe just a, a quick sanity check. So, the, so I'm going to talk about how intractability arises in algorithmic game theory. And the motivating application domains are going to be mostly game theoretic equilibria and computing them and the design of things like auctions. And these are topics, you know, you'd probably think that economists have thought about a little bit over the years. And indeed they have, a lot. And there's a, a lot of beautiful theory. So maybe just a sanity check, what can we expect theoretical computer science to contribute in these domains? What do we bring to the table? Well, there's a few things. Uh, the one which probably you'd be least surprised by is in traditional economic models. Again, there's going to be exceptions to all of these points, but generally speaking, uh, you know, computation is not even modeled in classical economic models. They don't even have the vocabulary to talk about computation as a constraint or other resources that we like to think about. So obviously treating computational constraints as a first order object is a natural way for us to contribute. Something I think that's more surprising is uh, the, our obsession with approximation and eluding impossibility or intractability results by settling for good but still approximate solutions really is fairly unique, I'd say, to what we do uh, in, in theoretical computer science and computer science more broadly. In economics, generally, you only study problems that have in some sense an exact solution or exact characterization. Approximation is almost never studied. So there's a lot of ways uh, that we can prove new results even about age-old economic applications. And then a, a final contrast is we, we like to think about worst case guarantees, minimal assumptions uh, about inputs or about distributions over inputs. It's much more common in economics you'll find exact solutions tailored to some particular setup. So robustness of worst case guarantees uh, is a final theme you'll notice throughout the things I'll talk about today. So the plan is uh, I'll touch on three different ways that intractability rears its head in algorithmic game theory. Uh, the first part is going to be in algorithmic mechanism design. And so what's really interesting about this field is we're going to have two different types of constraints. Computational constraints, like we're accustomed to, we're going to want protocols that run in polynomial time, but there's also going to be a set of game theoretic constraints, which of course would be familiar to uh, an economics audience, but a bit foreign, or it was at least, to computer scientists. And the goal is to have polynomial time protocols where selfish behavior leads to a desirable outcome, like an efficient allocation of scarce resources. And the key point here is going to be a, an interesting way that these two types of constraints amplify each other. And I want to uh, survey some recent highlights uh, sh showing how the intersection of these constraints is much more severe uh, than either one individually. Then I'm going to move on and talk briefly about a, a different form of auctions where instead of allocating resources, you're thinking about maximizing revenue. Uh, and here it turns out the, the mathematics is, it has a different flavor. So there's, even in the absence of computation, uh, computational constraints, there's intractability, information theoretic intractability. And I want to emphasize a recent interpolation between worst case and average case analysis that has enabled uh, strong positive results of relatively transparent auction formats uh, for these problems. In the third part, I'll switch gears. I'll talk about the complexity of computing game theoretic equilibria, especially Nash equilibria. I'll first jog your memory about some results that I think you've heard about, that computing Nash equilibria are hard in the sense of PPAD completeness uh, from five or six years ago. But the main thing I want to expose here, what I think are some really interesting, uh, still poorly understood research questions where I really think people in this room uh, could contribute in a, in a nice way. Okay, so my treatment of all the topics is going to have to be brief uh, because of the time. So I'll just mention some resources if you want to study these in more detail. For the algorithmic mechanism design section, uh, you know, one thing I, I, could, I could advocate was a tutorial I gave at Fox a couple years ago that talks about all this stuff in much more depth. There's a video. You can find a link from my homepage. So if you prefer sort of a reader's digest to take on the train as opposed to a video to watch, uh, there's a survey article I wrote around the same time for communications of the ACM, which would be a good starting point. Okay, so in lieu of defining incentive-compatible mechanisms generally, let me just sort of, you know, focus on specific examples. And let's just start very simply. Single item auction, there's a seller, you have one thing you want to sell, there's a bunch of buyers that might be interested in purchasing it. So here's a seller who has a, who has a vinyl record that they want to get rid of, and they have to figure out fundamentally two things. First of all, of the potentially interested buyers, who, if any, do you award this single good to? And secondly, what are they going to pay? So one possible solution to this problem is what's known as a second price auction, which is more or less what's going on in eBay. So in eBay, as a buyer, you have an opportunity to input a bid in this box. You can input it many times over time, but let's ignore that fact. So you can put your bid into this box, saying what you'd be willing to pay for it. 
And then at the end of the auction, when it terminates, the winner is sort of the obvious choice. It's whoever typed in the highest number. It's the highest bidder. The price, if you haven't seen this before, is not maybe the first thing you'd think about. It's what's called a second price or victory auction, which means if I win an uh, eBay auction, like if I type in, say, 50 bucks here, I, in general, am not going to be stuck paying $50. I'm going to pay less. So in, in fact, it's the uh, highest other bid, the second highest bid overall, that governs the price that I pay. So if the most anyone else bid was $30, I'm going to pay like $31, second highest bid uh, plus an increment. Okay, So that's an example auction, second price auction, highest bidder wins, pays the second highest uh, bid as a price. Why is it interesting? Well, the second price or victory auction has a number of interesting properties that we're going to have an eye toward generalizing to harder problems. So maybe most interesting is from a bidder perspective, it's trivial to play. So mathematically what I mean is as a bidder, you have a foolproof strategy. So the technical term is a dominant strategy. You do not have to reason about what other people are doing, which is really nice. It's always in your best interest to just bid your actual maximum willingness to pay, your actual valuation. So you just think, you say, well, 50 bucks is as high as I'm willing to go. You enter it, and then you just let the auction proceed. You don't worry about it again. Uh, it's, so it's private value. It's not about independent. It's about being private value. Yeah, yeah. But there's no distributional assumption here. Sure, if you don't, it's right, so the assumption is that you actually know your value for the objects. And if you didn't know the value for your objects, then it's a different model. So, uh, and so what I mean by utility, I'm just talking about your net uh, gain from the auction. So your value for the auction minus the price that you pay. No matter what other bidders do, that's maximized by just bidding uh, your true value, okay? So a consequence then, which is also really cool, is if you make the relatively modest behavioral assumption that bidders follow these dominant strategies, these foolproof strategies, and actually enter their true value, you get an efficient allocation of this scarce resource. There's only one item, only one person could get it, and you gave it to the highest bidder, which is the person who valued it the most. And arguably that's what you'd want from a societal perspective, okay? And clearly this runs in polynomial time, right? There's, it's just sort of trivial computationally. So the game, the agenda in algorithmic mechanism design is to get these nice properties of a second price auction, but much more generally for harder allocation problems. You want it to run in polynomial time. You want bidders to be incentivized to do the right thing. And at the end of the day, you want an efficient or almost efficient allocation of scarce resources. So what do I mean by harder allocation problems? What would be an example? Well, instead of there being one good, let's think of there being many goods. Okay? So here's a, here's a toy example. So imagine that there are, say, a bunch of houses on the market and a bunch of people looking to buy a house. And let's assume that, you know, the houses are different. People have different preferences. They may want one more than another. But let's assume no one's interested in having more than one house, okay? So in this, you know, this graph could represent that. There's three bidders on the left and there's four houses on the right. And each bidder has some possibly separate value, VIJ, bidder I for house J. And the question is, can we have an analog of the second price auction for this clearly richer allocation problem? Well, let's just follow our notes. So how would it work if there were uh, an analogy? Well, instead of now just having a single bid for the single good, we'd have to collect a bid from each bidder for each good. Okay, so for each I and for each J. Fine, we could do that. Now, what was the second step in the second price auction? We gave it to the highest bidder. And the way I want you to think about that in the interest of generality is we, in the second price auction, we essentially took the bids at face value. Okay, our working hypothesis is that actually was people's actual values for the goods. And then we just did the best thing. We're like, well, we can only give it to one person, so let's give it to the person with the highest value. So what would be the analogous computational problem we'd want to do here, given a bid from each bidder I for each house J? Maximum matching. Exactly. So we want to compute a maximum value matching. That would be, in some sense, the most soci societally desirable outcome if we take these bids at face value. Okay? Now, the third step was to compute a second high, to, was to charge a price, which was the second highest bid. And uh, why did we do that? We did it so that our working hypothesis was correct, so that, in fact, people were incentivized to tell us their true preferences. And the question, then, is there an analog of the, of the second price rule for this more complicated matching problem? So the answer to that question is not obvious. The answer turns out to be yes. It's not hard to prove. Okay? I could prove it in a single slide. I'm not going to do it in the interest of time. So for today, just trust me. There's a formula. It generalizes the second price rule. And indeed, if you charge these suitable payments, it will be the case that it's a dominant or foolproof strategy for everybody to tell you their true value for all of the houses. So now we have all of the same desirable properties for the single item auction, now for this more complicated allocation problem. It's in polynomial time. We can find matchings efficiently. And again, we have the correct incentives and a fully efficient allocation of resources. Cool. 
So let's look at a different example that has lots of goods. So now you might want to think of the goods as representing, say, uh, permits um, or, or licenses for some behavior in some area. So maybe uh, it's a, it maybe allows you to broadcast on a, on a certain frequency. Maybe it allows you to emit pollution in some area or so on. And I want you to think about bidders that rather than just wanting only one thing are kind of the opposite. They really need a set of stuff and they're not happy with any subset. So I'm a bidder, I want a bundle of things. Maybe this is all of the licenses to broadcast on a single frequency across California. It doesn't do me any good if I get a license for San Francisco without one for Los Angeles. That totally screws up my business plan. Okay, so think about bidders. There's a bunch of goods. That's this whole uh, rectangle. And each bidder wants some circle, some subset. And they really want it. Okay, they're not okay just getting a subset of it. So let's just try the same paradox. So what do we do? Well, again, we ask everybody, what are their true preferences? We say, what sets you want? How much are you going to pay for it? We take it at face value. We compute an efficient allocation to resources, meaning we maximize the values by packing a subset of the bidders whose bundles do not overlap. And then we charge suitable prices. Okay? So there should be a couple questions. Let me just answer one question, which is, again, it's not clear given the first two steps, whether there's a payment rule that gives people the correct incentives, that the exact same formula that worked in the matching case works in this packing case. Okay, so the third step is not a problem given the first two. You can incentivize people to tell you their true preferences. But to a computer science audience, right, the problem is obvious, which is... Right, how, how do you do this exactly? So when I said this was efficient, I meant economically efficient, societally efficient. I didn't mean computationally efficient. This, of course, is an empty hard problem. It's very easy to encode, say, independent set uh, as a special case of this packing problem. So it's actually really empty hard, hard to approximate, uh, et cetera. Okay? So if you ignore computational constraints, you get a positive result. Okay, you get all of the good properties of the Vickery auction, but of course you do not get polynomial time. So the algorithmic mechanism design research agenda, which was first really broadly articulated by Nissan and Ronin over 10 years ago, which says, well, you know, what can we hope for, assuming p is not equal to np, and then let's try to get all of it, okay? So we'd like a polynomial time algorithm. We'd like to get the best possible approximation of the underlying optimization problem, subject to p not equal to np. And we want players to be incentivized to do the right thing. So for example, to tell us exactly what they want so that we can correctly uh, do some kind of approximate optimization. And again, we've seen, you know, there are times, at least with exact optimization, where you can get away with this, single item options, max matching. For the packing problem at the moment, it's not so clear to what extent you can get these properties. Okay, so this is really algorithmic mechanism design in a half a slide. This is what it's all about. Now, what, you know, let's be ambitious. What would be the best case scenario? What's the most sweeping positive theorem we could have? Well, oh, so one, one quick point. So what's really interesting here is that there's two types of constraints, as promised, computational, polynomial time, game theoretic. So we want players to have these foolproof strategies. Now, if you only had one of these two types of constraints, we get a very well-studied problem. Right? If you delete the game theoretic constraints, we're just in pure approximation algorithms, which is obviously something at this point we know an awful lot about. If you delete the polynomial time constraint, as we noticed, there are these mechanisms uh, called the vickery clark groves mechanism, it's special cases we've been looking at, that solve the problem completely. So it's only going to be mathematically novel under the intersection of these two. And the best case scenario would be that, okay, we already understand what is and is not possible for most fundamental problems purely from approximation, ignoring game theoretic constraints. So the, we could hope maybe the game theoretic constraints we can accommodate for free with no additional loss in the quality of our approximation. That's the best case scenario. And given the, you know, the path I've been leading you along so far, there's even an obvious attempt for how you might, for every imaginable problem, do as well as you could without the game theoretic constraints which is you copy our three-step template, you ask bidders what are their preferences, you know, what goods do they want, how much are they willing to pay for it. You invoke the best known approximation algorithm for the underlying problem. So for example, for the packing problem, you could look at the best uh, known approximation algorithm for it. And then you would charge suitable payments, so again, that your working hypothesis in step two uh, is validated, so that in fact people are incentivized to give you their true preferences. Ah, good question. Uh, so, that's a good question. Generally, that, um, that's not an obstacle. So in the template I've been discussing so far, the way you would attempt to um, compute payments in step three would be one invocation of the same algorithm you used for step two, n times, once per bidder. So it blows it up by a factor linear in the number of players, but no worse than that. And even if you use different templates for mechanism design, I don't know of any interesting case where the intractability shows up 
only in the payments and not in the allocation. But again, that's not obvious. That's an excellent question. Right. Right. Yeah. No, so but it, it, but it doesn't get improved. That no, no, but, but uh, yeah. that's perfectly fine. Talk. I agree with Avi. So I, are you saying is this a bug or a feature? I, I would be inclined to think of it as a feature. <laughs> well, but what do you think? <laughs> I think, um, you know, I, I mean, so he, here's the sense in which this is the best case scenario. It reduces it to purely optimization. Okay. So it, it, just in general, for an optimization problem, when some new technology comes online. As, you know, now you have a bigger feasible region of how to solve the problem, and in some sense, that's only a good thing. Yeah, you might have to rewrite some software package or, or what have you, but you know, those are all problems that we've had all along. It's not, there's no extra complexity from the game theoretic constraints. So that's the sense in which I, this would be fantastic. It really says no extra complications, even though you want this seemingly non-trivial game theoretic constraint. Yep. Now, also, I think that you can that it's zero yep. and That's right. That's right. So, so Jing raises the good point that uh, I'm biasing this part of the talk toward a particular notion of incentive compatibility and you know, one of the strongest ones you might, you might hope for, which is every player having a dominant strategy. More generally in mechanism design, you have some notion of incentive compatibility. So you have some notion of an equilibrium concept. It could be this. It could be, say, you know, Bayes-Nash equilibria. If you have a prior, you can use a lot of different things. And in particular, I'm going to culminate with negative results at the end of this part in just a second. And now what the community is doing, I think very productively, is looking at e notions of equilibrium that are not as stringent as this one in search for new positive results. And there's been some successes along those lines over the last couple of years. So that's not, you know, this is, I, I'm going to emphasize, perhaps unusually for me, the intractability aspects today. So I'm going to focus on the most stringent equilibrium concept for which, of course, the negative results uh, are the strongest. That said, they're very new. So they're, you know, they're just the last few years that we've understood uh, even, even this concept. Yep, but point well taken. Then what is the benchmark? Uh, uh, so, so suppose people are not saying the truth. Yeah. What does it mean to compute the outcome optimally? So that what you then, what you, good question. What you then have to do is you have to really understand the equilibria of your mechanism. So, so, th so you raise a good question. So, because even in analyzing dominant strategies, I am making an assumption about behavior. I'm assuming that if players have a dominant strategy, say a unique dominant strategy, then they will play it. Okay? If they don't do that, then all bets are off, but I'm making that assumption. So when you do not have dominant strategies, you have to then redefine what is your assumption about behavior. And so the most standard way would be, you know, if there's an equilibrium, so say a Bayes-Nash equilibrium with respect to a common prior, well, not the optimum. So you want to argue, so there's two, the optimum just is what it is, right? So the optimum says, suppose you knew all the information and just computed things optimally. So the optimum is always the same. The bench, in part two, the whole point will be what's the benchmark. For our, Exactly, exactly. So the question is just how do you actually reason about, you know, the, you know, performance of your mechanism given that it involves these uh, self interested participants. But there are, you know, there's a, there's a range of equilibrium concepts which, you know, you can apply to games in the wild if you want, but you can equally well apply them to systems you design like these. Good. So this would be the proposal, this would be the first thing you'd try. You'd say, well, let's just replace exact optimization in step two by the best known off-the-shelf approximation algorithm. Um, yeah, that's exactly the question. So the reason this doesn't work, as suggested by the audience, is that, you know, I was hiding under the rug, how do you compute payments, and I promised you that for matching you could. I promised you for packing, if you solved it exactly, you could, and you can. I wasn't lying. But for approximation algorithms, in general, there does not exist a way of defining these payments that gives the correct incentives to the participants. Okay? And it's not just we haven't figured out the formula. You can easily prove it does not exist. Okay? So plug in an approximation algorithm, you cannot lift it to a mechanism with dominant strategies via a suitable payment rule. Now, so this is in a follow-up paper by Nissan and Ronan, and they did point out that there's a very specialized class of approximation algorithms. So if you ever heard the term maximal in range or VCG-like mechanism, that's what that means. There's a very special type of approximation algorithms for which you can define these payments. And in fact, a lot of the research last decade in algorithmic mechanism design can be summarized as designing novel approximation algorithms, which not only run in polynomial time, not only get a good approximation of an optimal solution, but also is in this subset, this special class, to get a good approximate mechanism. So I've worked on that, a lot of other people worked on that. 
Uh, but, you know, there were some successes, but there were also problems we failed to solve uh, by sticking just with approximation algorithms in this special class, in this sort of you know, bizarrely restricted computational model where the restrictions come from the incentive compatibility constraints. So, just in this decade, just in the last couple of years, uh, the tractability results of last decade have been complemented with intractability results. And so we now understand, and so the fundamental point is this, which is that for lots of natural problems, including some we care about a lot, actually, the joint, the intersection of computational game theoretic constraints leads to much more severe intractability than either one does individually. And so this is not the, the earliest example of this point, but it's maybe the, it's maybe the starkest uh, the earliest stark example by Pop, Dimitri, Shapir, and Singer. So they proposed a fairly natural computational problem. It's a special case of submodular function maximization. As such, if you don't care about game theoretic constraints, greedy algorithms will get you 63% uh, of the optimal solution. You can solve it using that Vickery Clark Groves kind of template if you don't care about computational constraints. But if you want to be both, if you want to satisfy both sets of constraints, you are stuck with a polynomial approximation factor. You cannot do better assuming that P is different than NP. It's called combinatorial public projects. So basically, um, you want to choose a sort of K subset of some universe. So you have sort of a universe of N objects, and you want to pick a subset of K of them. And then different bidders have different valuations over the K subsets. However, that was for a deterministic mechanism. That's correct. That's, it's, it's since been extended, but that's correct. And, um, and the proof, is, the proof is really nice. I mean, I'm not going to have time to talk about it in detail, but you know, for those of you that kind of really like kind of creative proofs, blending a lot of techniques from different areas, which is probably all of you, um, this is a great example. So it uses uh, things from economics. So Robert's theorem is one of these theorems which kind of says truthful mechanisms can only look like this very special form. You use the probabilistic method to argue that the range of the mechanism, if it gets a good approximation, has to be large. The sour shalal lemma says a large range implies a large subset of the range that's complete in some sense that has very nice hypercube-like structure, and that lets you sort of embed three sat problems, which gives you the hardness result. Now, over the past couple of years, there's been uh, kind of even, even sort of uh, nice extensions of this by various subsets of Dobzinski, uh, Dugmi, and Vondrak, and they extended these negative results both to the randomized case, which is what Anker was alluding to, but also to combinatorial auctions. So you just have a bunch of goods, and you want to allocate the goods in the optimal way, like what we were talking about before. Uh, and again, here the proofs are, are quite nice. So the, the latest constructions use error correcting codes in a way that you know I think must have been inspired by PCP construction. It's really, really quite nice. What uh, is the way in which the input is specified in both of these? I mean, the second one. Good. Uh, That's in fact exactly the issue here. So the initial results were Oracle uh, lower bounds, mm -hmm. and the whole reason you needed encoding was to have uh, computational complexity lower bounds. So they basically, were, you know, they basically had a compact representation. So. So you have m goods, and so in principle there'd be two to the m bundles, but that's not what they want. They want a hardness in terms of just right. polynomial so m. Um, so I, I think so maybe concisely specified submodular functions. Right. right? Exactly. Exactly. That, I mean, I think that was sort of an intermediate step, and then they kind of had more natural versions by using suitable encodings. Um, Essentially, it's a submodular function where there's some you know nice underlying subset that you'd like to hit. Yeah. But that's hidden under, you have to decode a random, you know, some linear code to be able to find it. Okay, so, so it's actually the sense far, it's far, but it's been so. Yeah, so exactly. It's like, uh, you, it's, you really it's, want. you know, there are very few submodular functions that you can encode so concisely, but it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's enough for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So by the way, so this is, uh, you know, this is sort of like, I, I guess I would call this an information theoretic notion of incentive compatibility. Yes. No way that they can. That's right. Has there been any work on a computational notion? That's a good question. Yeah. That you can't manipulate it without solving. I mean, this. The problem is that you have to solve hard problems to get good mechanisms. Right. But what if, in order for people to manipulate the mechanisms, they have to solve the same hard problem? That's a good question. Um, people have thought about this. I, I don't have anything super crisp, crisp to say about it. So for like locally decodable codes or something like this, it's a huge difference between. Theoretic and what you can do cryptographically. Yeah. Yeah. So let me, I don't, I don't think anyone knows a great answer to that question. Let me tell you the sort of a couple hints about the state of the art, which I don't think is satisfactory, but it'll indicate how people have been thinking about it. So one is um, back when we had this failed, we had this failed approach for approximate mechanism design. 
And so one of the things Nissan and Ronan pointed out, I think it's been observed in other places as well, but you know, if you try to implement this approach with an approximation algorithm, failures of incentive compatibility correspond exactly to somehow failures in approximation. So in some sense, people have a non way... Non-monotone. Hmm? Yeah, non-monotone. Right. right. But, and so, but to make it even more kind of operational, you know, if you as a bidder have an opportunity to deviate in a way that's beneficial for you, that deviation is in, in effect suggesting a better output than what the approximation right. algorithm actually generated. Right. So in some sense, the only way to improve yourself is to improve everybody. And so Nissan and Ronan proposed, now outside of dominant strategies, they, they proposed enlarging the bid space. And again, you can imagine different ways of doing this, but their approach was, I'm going to not just ask people for what they want themselves, but I'm going to let them give me advice on what the allocation should be. So if they have knowledge about some better allocation, and then you know, they'll you know, get the corresponding utility gain. And in a weak or equilibrium concept, they showed you could do this. So that's sort of one approach. Um, and then the other thing, I mean, the issue you're talking about, about so sort of... I guess of the point, I mean, it's sort of, it's somewhat related because, you know, in that bid mechanism, in order for someone to deviate, they would have to give a better solution for everyone. Exactly. So they would have to solve the problem better. Exactly. Case, That's so. exactly right. So kind of, you know, so it's the mechanism saying, hey, if you can do better than I can, you know, just tell me, you know, and I'll, I'll make use of it and you'll be as well off as if you deviated in the original mechanism. So that's, that was a reasonable approach. And then people have really been trying to tackle that problem head on more in voting rules, right? So when you talk about strategy proof voting rules with say more than two candidates, Gilbert Satterthwaite, which follows from Arrow's theorem, says you cannot have sort of a reasonable voting rule that's strategy proof. And so this, this is now more in the AI literature. Now on computational, uh, I mean, notion with non-manipulability? Yes, but I mean, there's no, I mean, the pun there's not a lot of crisp punch lines. So people have been trying to say, you know, can we have voting rules where it's hard to manipulate? Where, you know, we know there will be ways to manipulate. Gilbert Satterthwaite tells us I that see. information theoretically. But, but I don't know of sort of general techniques for sort of hiding that manipulation, in part because that literature is really focused on natural voting rules. Exactly. You have to create a very strange voting exactly. rule to uh, exactly. embed a hard problem. Now, that may well in principle be possible, and that may well actually be a nice line of research. But I, haven't, I don't know of anyone having done that yet. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to think about it. It's a little underspecified. I mean, what if multiple people solve the problem? Or I mean, I it's hard to manipulate computationally, but it's not very interesting. Right, so I guess that was, right, so that was sort of, um, I, 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 like you say, I think that's in the voting rule literature why they haven't gone down this path, because they're really focused on voting rules that people really use, and then it's, it sort of rules out on natural constructions like the one you suggest. No, but I mean, so in that, in that case, even uh, when conditioned on not solving that problem, you can still manipulate the voting rule. There's still a voting rule, right? So I mean, the question would be, can you get a voting rule which is less manipulable than uh, would otherwise be implied? Right, right. so, right, and which that- doesn't, I mean, doesn't change it, I don't think. I mean, anyways, maybe yeah. We're so, I mean, uh, the bottom line is people are thinking about this. I think it's a good issue. Um, but, I mean, there ha there ha certainly a whole a silver bullet has not been presented yet. So, um, okay, that was part one. Any other questions about part one? Okay, so let me move on to part two. Uh, uh, I don't think too many of you were here when I, when I spoke at Princeton um, a couple weeks ago. If you were at my talk a couple weeks ago, I apologize. There'll be a little bit of overlap uh, in this short part. So, you really appreciate yeah, I'll sing it twice, okay. All right. Um, okay, so uh, for more details on this, Jason Hartline, who's a professor at Northwestern, he's almost done with a, a beautiful book and there's a draft on his webpage, Approximation and Economic Design, uh, has much more uh, on these topics. So I'm going to keep talking about auctions for a little bit longer, but instead of focusing on those that want an efficient allocation of resources, I'm going to think about those that are designed to raise revenue for the seller. And perhaps surprisingly, the mathematics here, at least from our perspective, looks, looks rather different. Um, you might ask, why would that be? Why can't you just sort of, you know, treat it the same way? And the main reason seems to be that it's clear what your objective is. It's clear what your benchmark, your notion of optimal is. 
uh, in welfare maximization problems, right? So independent of their, even independent of the existence of any mechanism, I can just look and sort of ask, you know, what's the optimal solution for allocating resources to people? But, you know, when we're talking about maximizing payments, payments are actually endogenous. They're generated by the auction itself. And so it's not clear, you know, what, what's uh, the largest possible revenue? What's the optimal definition? What's the definition of an optimal for revenue maximization? But let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. So let's just, uh, you know, for concreteness, this theory can be made much more general. But just think about either a single item auction or maybe you have a K item auction. So maybe you have 10 iPods that are identical and I have 100 people I'm trying to sell them to. And again, you know, what's the point of an auction? You figure out who wins. So at most 10 people win the iPod and then what should they pay? You can certainly generalize the second price auction. You can have the top K bidders win and all pay the K plus one highest bid. That works fine. You know, but if you wanted to argue that it has, it makes a lot, large amount of revenue, how would you do it mathematically? And, you know, sort of the obvious approach, if you're versed in competitive analysis, like I think most of us are, would be to say, well, you know, we have some notion on a given input. Suppose you told me, okay, so what's the, right, so usually in competitive analysis, how does it work? You have an algorithm and it's hobbled in some way, okay? So maybe I only give you polynomial time, or maybe you don't know the future. And you compare yourself to some hypothetical ad adversary that is not thus handicapped, that has exponential time, that knows the future, et cetera. That gives you a definition, a definition of an optimal solution. And if you do almost as well as this obviously more powerful adversary, then that's a way of arguing that your heuristic is good. So we need some definition of opt, and we'd like to say that for some small constant alpha, input by input, we get at least a one over alpha fraction of ops revenue. In auctions, how are we hobbled? How are we handicapped? Well, we don't know what people are willing to pay up front. If we did, it would be easy, okay? I would walk up to, the, so if I could read minds, I'd walk up to the 10 people willing to pay the most, and I would just ask them to pay their maximum, you know, minus epsilon, okay? And I'd do great, all right? So that suggests an adversary, an, all, an omniscient adversary, how much revenue would they extract if they were selling K things to N people, they'd get the sum of the K largest willingnesses to pay, okay? So this is the first thing you would try, <laughs> coming from a competitive analysis perspective. And in a sense, this is a provably useless analysis framework. So what do I mean, what does it mean to be provably useless? Well, you can, of course, you know, it's a definition. You can make it. You can't stop me. I can do competitive analysis. But here are the kind of results you get. You get that, you know, every auction is terrible, okay? So every auction has basically an unbounded uh, competitive ratio with respect to this benchmark. Now, maybe I would still give the framework a pass, maybe, if it at least led me to some interesting auction, right? Maybe the ends would justify the means. But it doesn't. The optimal auction with respect to this benchmark just doesn't even look at the input and just offers random prices to people uh, based from a suitable distribution, okay? Which is not really what I wanted the theory to advocate. So this competitive analysis approach doesn't seem to work. So for one slide, let's overreact a little bit, okay? And let's say, well, let's just jettison worst case analysis and do the opposite, Bayesian or average case analysis. What if I had a prior? Okay, and this is just gonna be a thought experiment. But what if, and let's just keep it really simple, let's say it's one iPod and one person, okay? And all I can do is give them a take it or leave it offer, you know, 50 bucks, take it or leave it. So I don't know what they're willing to pay, that would trivialize the problem, but let's say I know a distribution, capital F, and I'm promised that this person's willingness to pay is drawn as a sample from this distribution, capital F. Well now, it's easy, a back of the envelope calculation tells me what take it or leave it offer I should give them. For a given offer P, how much money do I make? The revenue of a sale, times the probability of a sale, which is just the probability that their value is at least the price that I offered them. So I can just optimize this for P, okay? So if it was a uniform distribution, it would say I would offer a price of one half and I would get a sale half of the time. So, you know, what would be a more interesting problem? Well, for starters, you could scale the number of goods and the number of, of bidders. So what if we had 10 iPods and 100 bidders? And something that's remarkable, so this is a special case of, of Meyerson's theory. Those of you who saw me speak a few weeks ago, uh, you know, saw this in more detail. But actually, we completely understand the optimal solution. Uh, if there's a prior, okay, so if we know that bidder's values are drawn IID from a distribution F, all you have to do is the victory or second price auction with a suitable twist. The twist is you supplement it by a reserve price, okay? So a reserve price just means anybody who's not willing to bid that high is thrown out immediately, okay? So sometimes nobody will win, but sometimes you'll make more money because you had this reserve price that people had to clear, okay? And the reserve price depends on the distribution. P star is a function of capital F. If F is really big, of course, P star is going to be bigger. If F is always really small, P star is going to be smaller. But other than that, the format of the optimal auction is independent of the distribution. Okay, the dependence is only expressed through this reserve price P star, which in addition is independent of the number of goods and the number of bidders. Okay? So again, 
we just had two slides. Okay, the, pre the slide before this said, the obvious approach to worst case or competitive analysis is useless in a formal sense. This slide, the point is, if we have a prior, the problem is solved. Okay? So the question then is, can we get, in some sense, the best of both worlds? Can we have an interpolation between these two models that on the one hand gives us robustness that doesn't require us to know a prior distribution, that works simultaneously for many distributions? What's your model for an auction here? So, I mean, what do you mean? <coughs> <laughs> you know, are you just uh, saying a price? Or, I mean, how are so you for one specify? For one bidder. So this is not saying a price, right? right. Once you're running a Vickery auction, you're certainly not just saying a price. Right, but, you know, auction for with max, ex max expected revenue is. Yeah. So, so what's the constraint and how the auctioneer interacts with the bidders? So it's actually, so let's, I mean, uh, essentially none, actually. Um, so there's something called the revelation principle, which is a simulation argument, which basically says you can, oh, okay. you can focus on auctions. Um, so you can define, you know, I wasn't going to do I it. See. but. So And it turns out this is optimal not just with respect to dominant strategies, but even for okay. Bayes Nash implementations. So yeah. literally, you know, if you have this common prior, pretty much any selling procedure is fair game. Uh, but it turns out you can get away with an auction which satisfies all these much stronger I properties. I mean, if you think about it, that's what this does. Okay, so if you and I are in a second price auction. I'm getting offered the item in effect at your bid, and you're getting offered the item in effect at my bid. So that already happens quite quickly. So if the top three bids are 10, uh, and the top two bidders are, say, 9 and 8, it's like a really bad day. No, they pay 8. Oh, okay. uh, wait, sorry, one winner? Two winners, yeah. So you use the K plus 1 highest bid in, this, in the standard Vickery auction. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So it's optimal, actually, in a very strong sense, it turns out. But again, the, the high level point of the slide is, if there's a prior, this common prior that the seller is aware of, I'm going to think of the problem as completely solved 30 years ago. Okay? So uh, something I've been working on um, with my PhD students, this is sort of, um, there's actually been several people working on interpolations between worst case and average case analysis, but let me just uh, tell you about the model that I've been working on with my PhD students, prior independent mechanisms. So this is a blend of worst case and average case analysis. So it's going to be worst case with respect to distributions. Okay? So for the purposes of analysis, we're going to use a distribution to measure expected revenue. But we will not assume that the underlying distribution is known to the seller. We're just going to assume that it exists. Okay? So the designer, the auction designer, has to formulate some auction A so that no matter what the underlying distribution D is, provided the input is sampled from D, the revenue of the, our protagonist, the proposed auction, which again is independent of D, this expected revenue is almost as good as the optimal revenue you could get if you were told D in advance and optimized accordingly. So again, the key point in this inequality is that on the right-hand side, our competitor, this has more information than we do. The opt here is a function of D. On the left-hand side, the auction we're doing is independent of D. So again, remember, it's very much in the spirit of competitive analysis. You identify the way in which your algorithm is handicapped, you give someone else more of that, and then you try to do almost as well. And again, what you lack in auctions is information. You don't know what people are willing to pay. But in lieu of giving our competitor the actual values, all of the information, we give it statistical information. We give it a distribution from which the input will then be sampled. Okay? But then again, we want distribution by distribution to do almost as well as this better informed adversary who's running an optimal auction. So no, I want this to be independent of D. Okay? But certainly, you're probably getting at something which is, as I've written this, this doesn't make any sense. I haven't helped anybody with what's on the slide right now. It's uniform or not. Say it again? Yes, that's the whole point. That's the whole point. But so, I, I mean, what I wrote down just now is way too strong. Why? You see? I mean, I haven't restricted D in any way. Yeah. So D in particular could be any point mass, right? So in this in particular could be a single input. You mean, I, you mean I ID, I think. Exactly. So I, I mean I ID, as Avi says. So in general, uh, Let's see, so it depends if you mean for the definition or for the results. I mean, for the definition, I really don't care, single parameter or not. 
For the results in this paper, all of the applications are single parameter. There's more recent work uh, with Chi and Imbel Tagum Cohen, which also handle multi parameter problems. There's also some work by uh, Debonair, Hartline, and others that handle multi parameter problems. So it's more like last year there's been some multi parameter results. The first results were single parameter. Okay, so I mean, in general, this definition should be supplemented with some class of distributions that I want to compete against. Okay, and all distributions is clearly as hopeless as the previous worst case uh, analysis approach. And so something that seems like a good sweet spot that gives you generality, but also you can prove very strong positive results, as Avi anticipated, was C is IID. Okay, so you don't know what this underlying distribution is, but I promise, you, and you don't, you don't know if it's, you know, support is zero, two, or a million, two million, but I promise you that all the valuations are IID. Okay? There's a couple other obvious necessary conditions for non-trivial results. You need at least two bidders. With only one bidder, you'd be trying to guess a totally unknown number, and you can't do anything there. You also need a little bit of control over the tails. So like a log concavity type assumption uh, is sufficient. Okay? And in general, uh, the set C allows you to tune how close you are to worst case analysis versus average case analysis. If C is a single point, you recover the Bayesian world. Uh, and then, you know, if C is sufficiently big, you're as hard as the worst case analysis world. Well, so I guess I want alpha to be a function of C, is what I'm thinking of. And so in some sense, the bigger the C, the larger the alpha. And that trade-off I'm quite interested in. And I think it's worth, I mean, so we have, uh, you know, we have some understanding of, of that dependence. But, I mean, I could imagine much stronger, much sort of better parameterized approximation results than we have right now. You're right. I, I mean, I think... Uh, I mean, I think we're sort of saying the same thing. I mean, could you, you could imagine within a set C, parameterizing by something. You know, like for example, you know, how heavy the tails are, and then you have an alpha that's a function of that parameter. And personally, I'm a big fan of results like that. I have to be honest, you know, we don't actually have many in this space yet, but I think that would be really useful. Understand among the set which are the easier distributions and which are the harder ones. Because like, what Michael Fiddle think about is uh, like, uh, to say, okay, you know some distribution D, and then uh, alpha depends on how you That's true. The one thing I. I agree, and I, I mean the metaphor between learning and auctions is useful. Um, the the one distinction I'd like to draw is that in auctions you're often concerned. Often you think of n as being fixed; the number of bidders is fixed, and you can't take it to infinity. And you want guarantees even in the relatively small market case. Whereas, you know, often in learning, you think about polynomial number of samples, and then you do fine. That's, I mean, that's just. Depends a on the, you know what, what the number is. If it's below the DC dimension, you can do anything with the sub-body. And sometimes it's more rectangular than the plane. Sure, 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 sure. So how much um, does the revenue change if I don't allow revert, uh, reserve pricing? So, I mean, it seems like that's the, I mean, so that's the main way that the Meyerson mechanism interacts with. When you're talking about it. And is there a notion of like the diameter of a set C based on, you know, the, rever uh, the reserve price? Right? Yeah. Um, so, so. You would think like the two sets in there which are the most different would be the ones which are the hardest to get simultaneously right. Yeah. I, I mean. Or is that not. Uh, it's not clear. I mean, uh, what, what's really more important is kind of the information you get from one sample about. I mean, that may be important as well. But one key point is, you know, how much information do you learn about the rest of the samples from a single I sample? I see. So do you use maybe like half of it to learn a reserve price for the other half and vice versa? That's the spirit of it. In uh, fact, what's, what's cool here is, is you really only need, in general, one sample to get the ball rolling right. with the ID assumption. Right. And you get convergence. And this, again, is where we had to do things <coughs> a little bit differently than in learning theory. We really, you could get, you know, within one minus epsilon of optimal, again, assuming as a, uh, you know, very quickly with respect to the number of samples. So f even few samples gives you pretty great results, uh, which I think is a, a win for the analysis framework. Uh -huh. So, I mean, I, in general, I, I like the spirit of your question, which is, can you identify parameters of C, which sort of indicate what alpha for that C should be? Mm -hmm. And I do not, uh, you know, especially going beyond IID, 
I think that could be really useful. You'd like to have sort of a parameterized notion of heterogeneity of the distributions. Uh, I don't currently have a conjecture for what it should be, but I think results like that must, should exist. I think it's a great question. Okay, so I think I'm gonna, um, I wanna make sure I have time for, for part three. Um, I'll, I'll mention this quickly, okay? So why should these things exist? All right, so again, I, I said there's some obvious necessary conditions. You certainly need two bidders. You can't do anything with just one bidder when you don't know anything about them. You need some control over the tails. That's an easy example. You need to have, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, you need some kind of a homogeneity. But even with those, why should you be able to do anything? Okay, so what, you know, my group's been proving in the last few years is you can get these kinds of results for small alpha, for pretty big classes of C, uh, with, you know, pretty simple auctions. And this was our inspiration. So I'm not gonna tell you about our results, but let me just tell you, um, why we believed morally such results must exist. And it's the bulow klemperer theorem. And uh, so bulow klemperer economists, but I think it's a very computer science-y kind of result. It's definitely kind of one I would have been very happy to have proven myself. It's about single item auctions, but it's easy to generalize. So I think just one thing being sold, a bunch of ID bidders drawn from some distribution D. Regular, this is just a log concavity kind of assumption. So that's some control over the tails, which is necessary for the theorem. And what the theorem does is it compares the expected revenue, again, expectation is over the input with the values drawn IID from capital D, expected revenue of just the regular old Vickery auction, okay, with no reserve price, versus the revenue of the auction which is optimal for this distribution D, okay? So if you're gonna have an inequality between these two quantities, it's pretty obvious which way it goes, right? I mean, the left-hand side is some auction and the right-hand side is an optimal auction, so obviously the right-hand side's bigger. But in bulow klemperer it goes the opposite. And the way they get the inequality to go the opposite direction is they award the protagonist, the Vickery auction, one extra bidder, okay, whose value is again drawn ID from the same distribution, capital F. So with just a modicum of extra competition, it completely blows away the advantage that you thought you had from information. The left-hand side is independent of capital D, right? That's just a second price auction uses no information, and it does as well as an optimal auction with one fewer bidder, okay? And this is no matter what D is, subject to the regularity condition, even for N equal one, doesn't matter what N is. So this, you know, is really the, getting very close to the kinds of theorems, these prior independent approximation bounds that I wanted. It takes an auction which is independent of a distribution and says it's as good as an optimal solution for the distribution. So with constraints on D, for example, you can get constraints on Yeah, that's a consequence of this, right? So, so that's, uh, that's something you can drive as corollaries of this. Yeah, yeah, which is useful in other contexts, actually. Yeah. And so the, so the hard part, so, I mean, so the work that, you know, that's been done in my group is, again, going beyond single item auctions and identical copies of the goods. That's all pretty easy corollaries from bulow klemperer But again, what if you want to handle matching problems or packing problems, this kind of thing? That was our focus. Well, they do it just sample one of the bidders to get access to the distribution and maybe know the reserve price. Yeah, so, so, so that's, ex that's exactly the spirit of this result, yeah. So uh, if you enlarge your set of C and you said that every player is drawn from one of two unknown distributions, right, then right. with n plus two bidders, you could do the same thing with n plus five. Yeah, yeah, like let's see. Yeah. So let's say it for general model, you have uh, you know, You might need constraints on the two bidders that are drawn from two different distributions. Yeah, so you need But that's, that's where the five comes yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. But the, but the problem is for the other end, you don't know which distribution you came from. What? For the other end bidders, you don't know which distribution they came from, right? No, but if you have a prior sample, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So maybe, I mean, I'm just uh, wondering about enlarging C in this. It's a good question. So you just have several distributions. Each user is either of the, you know, of the cautious type or of the, right. you know, I don't know. And, right. Uh, but uh, but so you I have a few, and then maybe with a few extra bidders, you could simulate right. not knowing the so I can imagine two different models. One model in which the, the unsampled bidders, you at least know, okay, I don't know, I know this person is similar to this person in my sample, and then a different model where I actually have you know, completely unlabeled data, where I know nothing about. And the second model, the first model I think you're absolutely right, should definitely work. Second model I think is interesting. It's not clear to me whether it works or not. I, I think it's a good question, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's intriguing actually, yeah, I like it. Okay, so that's it for part two. Um, any more questions about part two? Otherwise, we're done with auctions. Yes, you can. You can. So it basically gives you kind of Lipschitz type control over you know how these revenues change. 
which has been used then as a lemma in other kinds of results. So that's, uh, that, I mean, and the computer science literature. So, it, so in addition to generalizing this, people have taken this as a black box and, and, and built on it. Yep, good observation. Yep. I mean, sh surely yes, but I've never seen anyone actually write it down. I mean, it's the kind of thing I, I, I'm tempted to assign it as sort of an undergrad or graduate project to work that out. Again, I, like I, I, I'd, I'd love to hear proposals for a convincing parameter, parameterization of how close to IID a bunch of distributions are. I mean, this seems like something that probably people have ideas about or have even worked on, but I, I, I don't know what they are yet. But I, I think surely those results must be, results of that form must be true. Then let's um, switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about um, the computation complexity of computing equilibria. Um, so this is a, a survey I, I wrote it for economists, um, but I actually think some of the sections were probably, you know, a good, uh, would be useful to the theoretical computer scientists as well. You can obviously skip the section on MP completeness, but if you sort of want a, 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 my perspective on things like PLS and PPAD, um, this is a survey I wrote a few years ago. Games, so I'm not, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time defining them formally. You know, you have a set of players. Each player is a set of actions. Uh, and we're going to be looking at Nash equilibria, where each player is doing what's best for it, uh, given the actions of the other players. So just to jog your memory, a couple examples. Uh, so Prisoner's Dilemma, I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, you know, there's a usual story with some prisoners, but you know, it certainly was a relevant example for von Neumann when he was here thinking about uh, US military policy in the Cold War. Prisoner's dilemma, each player has a dominant strategy, just like the auctions we were thinking about, something which is best for you no matter what the other player does. So for example, if you're the row player, the 10 and the 1 beat the 5 and the 0, and symmetrically for the column player. So each of the two players has a strictly dominant strategy to defect, so there's a unique Nash equilibrium, 1-1. One, one. Now this game is special in that the Nash equilibrium is pure. Okay? Neither player randomizes, it, it picks a single action with certainty. In general, there are not pure Nash equilibria, so there's the matching pennies game, which I'm going to call the penalty kick game. So there's a, there's a kicker and there's a goalie. Okay? And the kicker kicks left or right, the goalie dives left or right. Obviously the kicker wants to go the opposite direction of the goalie, and the goalie wants to go the same direction as the kicker. So there's not going to be a pure strategy Nash equilibrium, but you still have existence. There's a unique one, both of them as you'd expect, randomizing 50-50. Okay? Those are games, Nash equilibria. This suggests a very obvious computational problem. I give you an arbitrary game. Let's just stick with two players for today. So that can be encoded as a matrix, n by n. Each entry of the matrix has a pair of numbers, payoffs for the row player and the column player if they both pick that correspo those corresponding actions. So that's the input, simple to describe. What do I want? I want a Nash equilibrium. Okay, is that a well-defined question? Well, so first of all, existence is guaranteed. Of course, Nash proved this, not just for two-player games, but in general. For two-player games, there's a completely algorithmic proof by Lemke and Hausen. Nash equilibria need not be unique, but if there are many, let me keep your life easy. Give me any one of them, I don't care which, okay? So that's the two Nash problem. I give you a bimatrix game, you hand me a Nash equilibria. So no polynomial time algorithm is known for this problem, okay? And uh, a lot of people have thought about it. Not as many people have thought about this problem as say the traveling salesman problem, but still, a lot of smart people have thought about this computational problem. So, of course, that leads us to think maybe there is no polynomial time algorithm, and it's not something we're going to expect to prove unconditionally, so how would we amass evidence that maybe there's no polynomial time algorithm for the two Nash problem? Well, you know, the usual thing you do is you try to prove something's NP-complete, but this is one of those problems you're not going to prove NP-complete, and that's because it's an NP problem where witnesses are guaranteed to exist, okay? So remember, in a game, there's always a Nash equilibrium. So there's no real notion of no instances. The hardness is all in the search. So proving NP hardness of this two Nash problem would, for example, give you short certificates of unsatisfiability. You prove NP equals co-NP. So that's the wrong way to go. And so this, you know, this is a known issue about so-called TFNP problems, NP problems with guaranteed witnesses. And uh, so that would say, okay, well, you know, if the problem with proving that the two Nash problem is NP complete is that it lies in this subset, why don't we just prove it's as hard as anything in this subset? So why don't we prove that two Nash is as hard as anything with guaranteed NP witnesses? But that's not the kind of mathematical statement we expect to be true. And the reason is, you know, in TFNP, you know, different problems have guaranteed witnesses for seemingly very different reasons. So like factoring, you can also sort of put in TFNP. 
uh, and other problems. And so, you know, I've heard it said that this is a semantic class in the sense that without a universal reason for membership, you don't expect to have complete problems. So uh, Christos then had this idea, which was, well, you know, maybe we can identify subsets of TFNP where in some sense the reason for membership is common across the whole class. So syntactically defined classes which are going to have complete problems. And so he, he discussed a few of these. Local search, PLS is another well-known one. But the one we care about for today is PPAD, okay? All right, so what does PPAD stand for? I'll, I'll let you draw your own conclusions, <laughs> but allegedly, allegedly this stands for uh, polynomial parity argument directed version. If you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you. But, uh, okay, so the point is, if you looked at the two Nash problem and you said, you tried to reverse engineer a complexity class for which it might conceivably be complete, and you thought about it long and hard enough, and you were really smart, this is the definition you'd come up with. Once you see this definition, you say, oh yeah, if two Nash is gonna be complete for something, this is the right class to prove it for, okay? So Christos identified that quite a long time ago, over 20 years ago, and it took a while to actually establish that yes, indeed, two Nash is complete for it. Other natural problems were proven complete for PPAD, like fixed point problems. But two Nash, that was just in the middle of last decade. Definitely one of the sort of greatest hits of algorithmic game theory thus far. So hopefully you heard about this. Um, so it was proven for three players and more by uh, Daskalakis, Goldberg, and Papadimitriou, and then extended to two players by Chen Beng and Kang. Okay? So that's cool. All right. So if it was going to be hard in some sense for some complexity class, this is the one, and we know that it is. So has that closed the research field? So, you know, what I want to sort of end the talk with today is to try to encourage you to think that no, this is not really, this should be an opportunity to do new cool research, which has not really been happening uh, on this exact topic for the past five years or so. But I, I really think there's some nice opportunities. Okay, so first of all, I mean, the basic question is, what does it mean to be PPAD complete? Okay. It means as you're as hard as any other problem in PPAD, but how many such problems are there? How hard do we think they are? Why do we think they might be hard, et cetera? So, you know, when someone asks you, you know, an NP-complete problem, why do you think it's hard? One of the stock answers that we give is, well, look, literally zillions of people have thought hard about zillions of NP-complete problems, right? And no one has solved any of them. So that's pretty strong evidence. What can you say about PPAD? You can say, well, a reasonable number of people smart people, have thought hard about a couple of them, right? Which is nothing to sneeze at, but the evidence, the empirical evidence is not as overwhelming as for NP. And so there's really, I think, a lack of understanding in the community about how severe this intractability is. There are, you know, some kind of black box lower bounds, both for sp specifically for fixed point problems and then Oracle results for the different classes within TFNP, so that's sort of what we know. But, you know, if you sort of just think, devil's advocate, you know, what if someone came up with a polynomial time algorithm for, say, two Nash or any of these other PPAD complete problems, you know, would the world look different tomorrow? And I don't know of any strong reason, you know, like, for example, I don't know of consequences in the rest of, you know, the world of complexity um, that would be really shocking. I mean, we would just, quote unquote, have new efficient algorithms for a small number of hard, important problems. So that would be great, but um, it's, not, it's not the sort of ramifications that are sort of unimaginable. So in particular, like if someone came up to me at a conference and said they were trying to think about a polynomial time algorithm for two Nash, I'm not sure I would discourage them. You know, I, if nothing else, I think we would need better understanding on why such algorithms might not exist. Okay, so you know, what would I like to see happen? I mean, I guess I'd like to see people work on this question in both directions, okay, P versus PPAD. So I already mentioned the algorithmic side. Um, in particular, you know, forget about maybe polynomial time. I mean, even just get a sub-exponential time algorithm for the exact two Nash problem. I see no reason why this should be impossible. So for approximate? No. The one where you can just do yeah, that's here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Right, so for exact, you know, get two to the root n or something like that. I see no reason why that, that should not be possible. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you could relate that to the exponential time hypothesis, that would be, I wouldn't expect that, but that would obviously be amazing. Um, and then, you know, obviously, you know, it's probably unsurprising we don't have some unconditional understanding of FP versus PPAD, but what, what I find more surprising, perhaps, I was talking to Avi about it before the talk, maybe there's good reasons for that, but I'm a little surprised that, it, you know, we haven't been able to relate anything in TFNP to other types of problems around the NP, intersect co-NP boundary. So, for example, are there any connections in either direction between, say, PPAD problems and, you know, cryptographic hardness assumptions? Any, any connections at all? Are there any connections to, say, quantum algorithms? Is, are these reasonable uh, candidates to have a polynomial time quantum solution? 
I, I, I'm, not so I'm not so sure, but, but why not? Could you prove that they're not good candidates? Um, as Ankur was anticipating, one potentially easier algorithmic place to look is approximate Nash equilibria. So this just means each player is approximately doing the optimal thing, given what the other player is doing. The reason people seem to think this is easier is there's a quasi-polynomial time algorithm for it, n to the log n, where n is the number of strategies. Um, I sort of would actually conjecture that improving quasi-polynomial for approximate Nash equilibria would require solving this problem. Okay? I, I can't prove that, but I believe there might be a reduction that says sub-quasi-polynomial time for approximate implies sub-exponential for exact. What's the proximity? Constant. Say point, point 0.1. So say payoffs are scaled to be in 0, 0,1. One plus epsilon, and you can get the slow approximation. Sorry, you're right. You can get um, one plus epsilon for any epsilon you want. In quasi-polynomial time. Quasi-polynomial. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's end of the log, yeah, yeah. End of the log over epsilon squared. It's from a turnoff argument. But you were saying for the, yeah, so right. So as Avi says, constant epsilon as small as you like. So it's a one over epsilon squared in the exponent. Well, it would be the more. Well, it would be the reason why you did use the uh, quadrant of the cards. <coughs> you, that would be one, uh, it's, it's a good discussion point. It's even worse than that. I mean, so, so the notion of, a, of approximate equilibrium here is weaker than what you might want. So all it claims is that each player separately is doing almost the optimal thing for it. And this does not mean, for example, that the pair of, of uh, probability distributions is close in any metric to an exact Nash equilibrium. So it's not really like a local approximation type result. It's just as far as the incentives of each player separately. That's right. That's right. And then you search on them for them in this. Exactly. And this is exactly why I'm actually tempted to conjecture that this problem and this problem is linked. Because, I mean, really, what the algorithm here shows is that there's a natural compression in the, in the search space for approximate Nash equilibria. And there's absolutely zero structural understanding of what that search space looks like. And I think if you could do something better than brute force search in that compressed search space, there'd be, I think, major hope that that might actually extend to the exact search base for, for exact Nash equilibrium. That's kind of my intuition for why maybe these are linked. So I, I guess, I mean, a different, I, not to disagree with you, but I, another, a second interpretation would be maybe it just says something about epsilon Nash equilibria being kind of not necessarily a, that sharp a game theoretic notion. That would be the alternative interpretation. Well, even this is not based on sampling. This is based on brute force search. So in the proof, so which, yeah, so there's a lemma based on sampling where you argue that small supports suffice. So that lets you get away with this particular search space. Right, but that, that's exactly, I mean, so that's, I mean, in some sense, we don't know anything better than brute force search. Now, that's not quite true because PVD problems you can solve with some kind of guided brute force search. And so the Lemke-Hausen uh, algorithm, the way it works, it defines a path. The vertices of this graph, exponential size graph, are sort of potential equilibrium pairs. And there's a way in which you can search through this graph by following a path, and it's guaranteed to terminate at a Nash equilibrium. The problem is there's an exponential number of solutions, and so it might take exponential time. But unlike something like satisfiability, where you just try all witnesses and all of them might not work, here you're guaranteed that this guided search will eventually terminate. And, <coughs> in the sa and, and we don't have any algorithms that look fundamentally different than that. So we've been very stuck on the algorithmic side. So they have a bigger approximation uh, algorithm uh, for the whole PKD class? Um, or for the larger class? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, it's not clear what epsilon yeah. approximate means for. Yeah, you could look at specific so ones. Uh, look for six points instead of six points approximately. 
I don't know of a, of a kind of non-trivial algorithm, or an algorithm with non-trivial guarantees for fixed point problems. And if, if anything, they seem even worse than the equilibrium computation problems, I'd say. Be I mean, in some sense, equilibrium computation problems are special cases of fixed point problems, where you at least know a little bit more about the function. So that's a good question. Is there some other, I mean, part of the problem is we don't have so many PPAD complete problems. So I think, you know, interpreting that broadly, I think, is really interesting. Could you imagine some possibly different PPAD complete problem? And there are some others where you can get some kind of more interesting kind of a you know, sort of non-brute force search type approximation algorithms. I don't know of a result like that. It's a good question. Is the interesting process for the, the split version of, uh, of uh, six points? Oh, for sure, I mean, I for sure. I agree. I agree. I, I don't know of a really sort of novel algorithmic technique that's come out of these PPAD problems. I mean, if, if they're, and this is why, you know, you know to the root end, I, I'm not so sure you'd get this just from brute force search. I think you'd have to do something. And we'd love to just see kind of any progress on the algorithmic side. And so that's why I really want to emphasize it's not like polynomial timer bust. There's a lot of opportunity for new ideas, I think. Uh, That's a good question. So for two players, this issue doesn't come up, it turns out. So for the two, for the, so in general, three or more players, you're right. For two players, uh, without loss, you can think of um, equilibrium strategies being solutions to poly size linear systems. So basically, your utility is a linear function uh, in the probabilities of the other players, of uh, the other player. That's what's important. So you have, the point is you have small bit complexity in the two-player case without loss. Yes, it's algebraic, yeah, yeah. Because basically, I mean, you know, you look at the other players and then it's, you know, your utility is just some sort of polynomial uh, function of what, you know, the product of the other player's strategies. But it, it doesn't seem to have structure beyond that. It doesn't seem significantly simpler than just sort of general polynomial functions in that form. That's right. So Nash, in an early, you know, one of his early papers, gave a three-player poker-based example where the unique Nash equilibrium, even though all the payoffs are, are integers, uh, the unique Nash equilibrium, they're all irrational. I mean, they're not, you know, they are, they're solutions to degree two polynomials, but, but they're not rational. So is the Lenke-Hausen algorithm known to take, like, c to the n time for finding... It is. Yeah, exactly. It is. In fact, the unconditional lower bound for Lemke-Hausen predates the pp completeness results. Mm -hmm. So it's a result of Savani and von Stengel, Fox 04. Mm -hmm. It's actually a really nice um, construction based on cyclic polytopes. But uh, it's for a particular, I mean, so there's freedom in Lemke-Hausen and a pivot rule, or there isn't? No, so they, they uh, proved, in effect, a diameter lower proved, bound. So there is a diameter lower bound. Yeah, so there was a previous result which, you know, I think made uh, some... Um, they were building on a previous result, maybe by Barani, although I forget, who, who they did make a couple assumptions, I think, about maybe just the very first step of the algorithm, but the Savani von Stengel lower bound is it, it's exactly what you want. Statement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really on the product of two polytopes. Do we have anything that even tries to get away from a diameter bound here? I mean, so the epsilon, I mean, uh, you know, anything that could work for exact that gets around the diameter bound. Yeah, that's a good question. Even that, I don't know. I mean, in some sense. Right, right. So that would be, so th those, those don't seem limited by diameter bounds, but neither are there good convergence results for them. Mm. So, I mean, sometimes I think you're getting to the heart of the issue. I mean, in the same way, you know, presumably for linear programming at one time, putting it in P really meant getting away from path following. Right, but there the lower bounds right. are. I agree. Much, yeah. But let's just say, you know, unless you wanted to solve the diameter problem, you had to get away from path following. You know, so here again, it's, it's unconditionally clear you have to get away from path following. So, okay. Um, and then that's it, and I'm over time. So, thanks very much. Thank you. Ching. Uh, about uh, Heinrich, I think one reaction of Heinrich is that when we consider a basically worst case Heinrich, and uh, we are not writing about it that much, we assume that. Maybe we, I think we have some average 
Yeah, so, I mean, this was a broader point I was going to discuss. This is my last bullet here, which was, um, I mean, frankly, you know, I think, you know, studying the complexity of these equilibrium computation problems in these complexity classes, I think this is totally interesting in its own right. So independent of connections to economics, I think we should be studying this stuff. That said, to the extent that there are opportunities for this work to have influence in, say, economics, I mean, I think that we should also explore that. And, you know, I think the jury is sort of still out. I mean, a bunch of computer scientists have made some pretty provocative statements about what these results mean. And I think that's cool. I think it's good to kind of, you know, get the conversation rolling, um, you know, and, and, and get, get a lot of awareness of these results. And, uh, you know, many economists and game theorists have sort of pushed back uh, for various reasons. Um, and that, that, you know, they have a lot of good points. Um, one, which you're mentioning, is the worst case analysis aspect. Um, and... It would, I mean, personally, I'm not even convinced this is kind of the topmost objection. Um, but I think. Th well, I mean, I, I think here's, here's, the, here's the biggest issue is that it's not clear. I mean, let's even assume we had an average case hardness result. <laughs> so, first of all, I think that's an excellent research question <laughs> as to what extent. And certainly, if you had anything about. There are some results that say random games are easy. You know, it's for very specific IED models. But so I think more results on either side, you know, either about hard distributions or about positive results for specific distributions. It, both of those are interesting. But even if we had average case hardness, it's not clear that's number one on list of problems with an ASH equilibria. Right? So if you're doing, so the point is, even modding out by computation, there's, there's a lot of, there's just a lot of barriers to kind of treating Nash equilibrium analysis literally. For example, it's not unique. So often when people study economic models, they study economic models without unique, with a multiplicity of Nash equilibria. And usually you have one in mind. And it's often hard to make the case, uh, you know, short, short of running lots of experiments about why you think that's going to be played. And so uh, maybe a different way of phrasing the point would be, even in games where Nash equilibria are obviously easy to compute algorithmically, it still remains a little unclear yeah, and let's just, yeah, for example, and that's just one example. Um, so, so the, 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 you know, so basically if you want to criticize Nash Equilibria, you need to kind of get in line. There's sort of a long line of people who, who want to do that. But here's the other thing I'd say, which is, you know, if Wait, so it, is, are you saying that the reason economists don't care for, you know, complexity lower bounds is that they have their own criticisms? Yeah, it's, it's not, anyways? so that's okay. one, no, it's, it's okay. a two, that's one point actually. So it's not, like, it's not like they didn't already have doubts about that. It's, it's not like they thought it was a flawless concept. But secondly, you know, when, and this is true really more broadly in life, right? When you come to someone with a criticism, right, it's sort of very helpful. It's much more productive to come with an alternative. You know, it's, it's say, I see some issues with doing this in this way. You know, here's some evidence that it might be better to do it in this other way. I agree. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, sometimes in the conversation, that's been lacking, right? And so... Um, so what would be just amazing, uh, it's not clear this is possible, but what would be amazing is if we actually could say, instead of using Nash equilibria, use X, right? Now, th you know, there's some, you know, so for example, like correlated equilibria um, ha is, is more tractable in many senses uh, than Nash equilibria. So I think the computational lens does, so does give, I think, new credence to correlated equilibrium analyses. Um, so there are examples, I think, where, where we have been successful. Did Alman uh, mention this when he was paper about the tractability, yeah. no, no. I, it was not tractable then. Uh, because that's true, no, that's I true. Wonder if he said anything it was 74, yeah, so it wasn't tractable. Yeah, it was before, but I just wonder if he, if he Yeah. that may be easier to compute. That's a good question. I mean, he would have, I mean, I mean, he, he clearly knew it was convex, right? So I mean, the convex versus yeah, non-convex, yeah. right? And so that dichotomy was already probably yeah. sort of a proxy for nice versus not nice. Um, so those, those would be the, 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 the two things I'd say, right? So, so if you wanted to make Nash equilibrium analyses more accurate or more believable, it's not clear complexity is the first place you'd start. You might want to actually make contributions about equilibrium selection, explaining which of any equilibria uh, are played. Um, right, and so, and so, you know, and then the second thing is, I mean, uh, you know, anything, you know, it, and again, there are, we have made some contributions along these lines, but I mean, I think that's, I mean, that, that could then really go viral if, if we could actually come up with some uh, alternative rooted in tractability concerns, which actually seem to be a better model, seem to overcome the non-computational obstacles of the Nash equilibria. That'd be incredible. So.
But anyways, I think the conversation, you know, I think it's, I think it's been healthy and I look forward to it continuing. So I think it's going to be good.